Chapter 20, The Circulatory System. In today's lecture, we need to answer and understand two very important questions. First is, why might a patient have a higher resting heart rate following a heart attack? Secondly, why does aerobic exercise lead to a reduced resting heart rate and blood pressure, and why is this healthy? We'll also talk about anti-angiogenic foods and why that's a dumb idea, even if they could work, and we'll talk about the structure of varicose veins and what can be done about them. I'd like to start with these images from the book. Remember, pictures are supposed to simplify things for us, and these pictures are anything but simple, but they illustrate the complexity of blood pressure regulation. So today's lecture is going to be a little bit confusing. We'll talk about things one at a time, but at the end you need to come back and put it all together into one big picture, and that's going to be tricky. For this reason, it's going to be tricky to try and keep a patient's blood pressure under control. These aren't simple negative feedback loops, but very complicated ones with lots of branches. To do all of this today, we'll talk about the basic anatomy of arteries, veins, and capillaries, we'll talk about where blood is located, and then we'll talk about things that regulate blood pressure. And to do that, we'll have our last equation out of the three that we introduced in Chapter 19. And once we understand this equation, we can use it, and it will help us to understand why aerobic exercise is good for us, but heart attacks are bad for us. Let's start with some basic anatomy. Arteries always carry blood away from the heart. As these arteries travel further away, they get smaller and smaller until we call them arterioles, and eventually they become capillaries. And this is where gas exchange occurs. And then the blood would be returned towards the heart via veins, the smallest ones being called venules. You'll notice the same pattern is true for the systemic circuit as it is the pulmonary circuit. The pulmonary arteries here in blue are carrying deoxygenated blood to the lungs. Gas exchange occurs in the capillaries and the blood is returned to the heart via these pulmonary veins. So the red and blue here illustrates where oxygen is located. Arteries and veins are always named based off of the direction of blood flow, not whether that blood has oxygen or not. Arteries and veins contain the three same layers. There's an outer layer called the tunica externa. This is mostly connective tissue full of collagen fibers that are going to be very important in today's lecture. The middle layer is called the tunica media, and this is mostly smooth muscle. And the innermost layer is a layer of simple squamous epithelial cells. And these cells are so special that they get their own name, and it's called the endothelia. These cells produce a lot of hormones, for instance, and are involved in blood clotting and blood pressure. So we're going to worry about these cells a lot today. Arteries and veins tend to run side by side. The arteries are typically smaller, but have more muscle and elastic fibers, so they should appear rounder, whereas veins are often bigger and flatter. The arteries are also tougher because of all of that extra muscle tissue. So on this image here, on the right hand side, some pressure has been placed in the femoral area, which has compressed the femoral vein, but the femoral artery is still visible in this ultrasound. That's because it's a stronger organ and it's under higher pressure, so it's harder to compress. Let's start by focusing on arteries. They have two important properties, elasticity and contractility. Elasticity means that as we pump blood into our arteries, they have to expand. So during systole, the arteries expand, but then during diastole, they snap back to their original size. Contractility means that we can further regulate the pressure inside of the arteries with a contraction of smooth muscle. If I contract those smooth muscles, we'll call it vasoconstriction, 
and this tends to increase blood pressure. Vasodilation is the relaxation of the smooth muscle tissue, and this tends to lower blood pressure. The capillaries only contain the endothelial layer. Therefore, this barrier is very thin, which is perfect for gas exchange. Endothelial cells have a number of very important functions, which is why they get their own special name. Being a simple squamous epithelium, endothelial cells are a barrier. Only some molecules can be absorbed from the blood into our tissues, and some wastes from our tissues back into the blood. They're also a barrier to cells. Red blood cells cannot escape the bloodstream. However, white blood cells will need to be able to move out of the bloodstream from time to time. And to do so, they'll have to squeeze between the endothelial cells, unzipping the tight junctions and desmosomes temporarily to get to the other side. Endothelial cells also produce a number of important hormones. One of the most important ones today is going to be nitric oxide. This is going to lead to vasodilation in tissues that are hypoxic. In the next chapter, we'll talk about their role in blood clotting. Similarly, endothelial cells can also produce a growth factor that helps to promote the growth of other tissues that have been damaged. The endothelial cells in the tissue sense the damage but then they tell the other cells to start dividing. Lastly, endothelial cells are involved in the very important process of angiogenesis, or the growth of new blood vessels. They can migrate and create new capillaries if they are given the, si the signal VEGF. The capillaries that we will be discussing today are the continuous capillaries. These are your basic capillaries. There are, however, two special types of capillaries, called the fenestrated and sinusoidal capillaries. These I will cover in detail in BI-233, so we're going to skip their function and structure for now. The continuous capillaries are organized into capillary beds, which include a whole bunch of what are called true capillaries, plus a vascular shunt that runs down the middle. The reason that we have capillaries organized in this fashion is to allow blood to perfuse this area or to simply pass through it, and that's going to be regulated by bands of smooth muscle called precapillary sphincters. These smooth muscles can either relax or contract. When they are relaxed, blood will perfuse the area. If this is the skin, then I would have a lot of blood flowing close to the surface of my body, and I would be radiating off heat. If I were to get cold, however, the brain could send a signal to close off these precapillary sphincters. Now the blood flows to the skin and then right back out and does not get a chance to lose much heat. These two images should illustrate that capillaries are found nearly everywhere. The only places we really don't have them are in our epithelial tissues and in cartilage tissue. Otherwise, every place else, including muscular tissue, neural tissue, and connective tissues, are full of capillary beds, these dense networks of very fine little organs. Capillaries are small and thin, and so this is where gas and nutrient exchange occurs. As blood enters into a capillary, some of the fluid of that blood is forced outwards. And then at the end of the capillary bed, that fluid can be reabsorbed. However, not all of the blood is reabsorbed. A little bit is going to be lost and will need to be collected by the lymphatic system, which I'll talk about in more detail when we get to chapter 21. This blood is then returned back towards the heart via veins. These blood vessels are larger than arteries and under lower pressure, and they have valves. That makes them structurally different. At least all of the veins from the neck down do. And so we did not just make up the name artery and vein based off of their direction. 
there's definitely anatomical differences between these two types of organs. The function of the valves is to make sure that blood only flows in one direction, back towards the heart, even if this blood flow is in the opposite direction of the force of gravity. The valves can only be opened in one direction, therefore blood can only push them open and move towards the heart. If something were to try and force blood backwards, such as gravity, the valves would not open in the opposite direction. The veins are under low pressure, so next we need to ask how is blood being forced back towards the heart even if it has to work against gravity? That has to do with the pulsation of nearby arteries and the contraction of nearby muscles. As these things squeeze, it would force blood both upwards and downwards. But thanks to the valves, downwards is not an option. So the random contraction of muscles in the body helps to propel blood back up towards the heart, even when it's working against the force of gravity. When these valves do not close properly, blood will pool in the lower extremities. This can be painful, and often people do not like the sight of what are called varicose veins. The treatment of varicose veins is to just destroy them. This can be done with lasers or chemicals that damage the veins and cause them to be replaced by scar tissue. Luckily, we've got a larger number of veins than we need. So even if you destroy a few veins, blood can still return towards the heart because of this redundancy in the system. For those that need to inject needles into veins, you are going to want to avoid hitting the valves because that can be painful for your patient. To find the valves, you can press down on a vein with two fingers, cutting off blood flow into the vein and then push the blood that was there back towards the heart with a second finger. If you lift the second finger, blood will backfill the vein up until it reaches a valve. This is something you can do on a friend or lab partner pretty easily. Find a big vein, push the blood out of the vein towards the heart, and then simply let go with the first finger So that's some basic anatomy of the arteries and veins and capillaries. Next, let's talk about where blood is located. Even though the left and right sides of the heart were pumping the exact same amount of blood, there's a larger amount of blood on the vein side of things than the heart. It's just the amount leaving the veins is the same amount that is entering the veins at any given time. That's because the veins are larger and under lower pressure, so the blood in the arteries is traveling faster. All of that blood exerts some pressure on the walls of the arteries and veins, especially the arteries, because those are close to the heart. And when the heart squeezes, that forces blood out of the heart and into the arteries. Just like if you were to squeeze on a syringe, it would force fluid out of the syringe through the needle. This leads us to the topic of measuring blood pressure. Blood pressure is primarily regulated by cardiac output as well as a new factor, peripheral resistance. The amount of blood is also an important factor, but we're not going to be covering that until BI-233. I need to introduce this concept of peripheral resistance. This is a representation of how large or small the arteries are. It turns out that the size of the arteries alters blood pressure by the fourth power of the diameter change. And in layman's terms, what this means is that it only takes a small change in blood vessel diameter to elicit a very large change in blood pressure. Constricting arterioles by a small amount will squeeze that blood into a smaller space and therefore it will be under higher pressure. Conversely, dilating those arteries we have the same amount of blood now in a larger space, and the blood pressure decreases significantly. These changes in blood vessel diameter can be mediated by the medulla oblongata, 
controlling smooth muscles around the arterioles, but they can also be influenced by fatty plaque deposits. Let's say I've got enough space for four blood vessels to travel down this artery. If I have a small plaque blocking the flow of one of those blood vessels, it'll bump into the next one, which bumps into the next one, and this causes turbulent flow. Just like blocking one lane of traffic on a freeway can snarl everybody's ability to get past that area. A small fatty plaque can create turbulence in this area, which greatly increases blood pressure. Really quickly, I'm going to distinguish between atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis, although this will not be important for any of my exams. Technically, atherosclerosis is the thickening of an arterial wall, such as by fatty deposits, whereas arteriosclerosis is simply the hardening of the artery wall. And hard artery walls do not vasodilate very well, so both of these things tend to increase blood pressure. Quite frequently, if you get a fatty plaque deposit causing atherosclerosis, that also hardens the artery wall so you also get arteriosclerosis. For the rest of this lecture though, I'm going to be using these two terms rather interchangeably without paying too much attention to the technical differences. The development of atherosclerosis is a two-step process. First, a patient must get fatty deposits somewhere in their arteries. Risk factors for this include eating too many trans fats, having too many free fatty acids floating around in the bloodstream, having high levels of bad cholesterol, also known as LDLs, and even high blood glucose, as seen in patients with diabetes, can increase the risk of fat sticking to the walls of arteries. But that's not enough. Next, these fatty acids must be oxidized by macrophages, which are attracted to LDL particles sticking in the area. These macrophages release more inflammatory molecules, which attract more macrophages, which oxidize more LDLs, which makes them even stickier, and therefore they attract more fatty acids and glucose. And this process increases in a positive feedback loop. So it's important to prevent this from starting in the first place. Next, I'm going to discuss vasodilation and vasoconstriction and how changes in blood vessel diameter might change blood pressure or they might change blood flow. This boils down to a question of am I changing the diameter of all of my blood vessels? If so, that'll change blood pressure. But if I'm vasoconstricting some blood vessels while vasodilating other blood vessels, then I might be regulating the flow of blood from certain organs to other organs. Let's start with blood pressure. We can measure blood pressure quite easily using a sphygmomanometer. This will give us a systolic and a diastolic reading. The systolic pressure is of course the pressure in the arteries right as the heart is contracting, whereas the diastolic pressure is the lowest number. That occurs when the heart is relaxed. We could calculate the pulse pressure, which is the difference between the two, and furthermore, we can even calculate a mean arterial pressure, which is roughly an average between the two. Although technically, this value is a little bit closer to the diastolic than it is to the systolic pressure. For a healthy patient, their blood pressure should be somewhere around 120 over 80. Different textbooks might give you slightly different numbers for this. But in general, anything above 140 over 90 is considered hypertension. Some patients may have abnormally low blood pressure, in which case we would say they suffer from hypotension. This latter one is fairly easy to treat, and that's because salt tends to increase blood pressure, so we can tell these patients to eat more salt, drinking things like Gatorade instead of water, and that helps to raise their blood pressure. Unfortunately, treating high blood pressure is going to be a lot trickier, and that's because our body has a number of homeostatic mechanisms for raising blood pressure and not that many for lowering blood pressure. Here's a figure from our textbook 
Now, in theory, pictures are supposed to be easier for us to understand than words. Unfortunately, I think words would have been easier than these graphs. Nevertheless, the ability to interpret graphs is a useful skill in medicine, so I'd like to spend a minute going over what these say. The x-axis is going to be the same in all four graphs. We've got the aorta on one side, capillaries in the middle, and the vena cava on the other side. And what this first graph measures is vessel diameter. So hopefully by now you've figured out that what this first graph is trying to tell us is that the aorta and the vena cava are the largest of our blood vessels, whereas capillaries are really small. Let's go to the next one. Over here, we're now measuring cross-sectional area. And this is total area. And again, we've got the aorta, capillaries in the middle, and the vena cava on the end. And what this tells us is that even though the aorta and vena cava are really large, there's not very many of them, just three in total, whereas we've got lots and lots of capillaries. Therefore, there's a lot more space in our capillaries than there are in our large arteries and veins. Let's go to the lower left. We have the same x-axis, but now we're going to talk about average blood pressure. So what this tells us is that blood pressure is highest in the aorta and it's very low in the veins. That brings us to our last one, which is velocity. And what this should show us is that blood is flowing pretty quickly in the aorta, but it slows down by the time it gets to the capillaries. But then it speeds up again by the time it gets to the veins. So we got through those graphs. And we also covered some of the basics about blood pressure. And we added this last equation. Blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times peripheral resistance. We even learned that small changes in peripheral resistance lead to really large changes in blood pressure. And so it only takes a small amount of atherosclerosis to lead to elevated blood pressure in a patient. Next, I'm going to discuss in more detail how the brain regulates blood pressure. And we're going to be focusing on cardiac output and peripheral resistance. Just keep in mind that next quarter, the kidneys are also going to be very important because they regulate the volume of blood. Let's start with cardiac output. Our resting heart rate should be controlled predominantly by parasympathetic tone. Acetylcholine being released from the vagus nerves onto the heart hyperpolarizes the SA node, leading to a lower resting heart rate. But under stress, parasympathetic tone is decreased and sympathetic tone increases, and this will not only speed up heart rate by depolarizing the SA node, it also increases the strength of muscular contractions throughout the entire heart, which has an effect on stroke volume. We need to go back to this equation that we covered in the previous lecture. Stroke volume equals the, what you fill up with minus what's left over. So the end diastolic volume is the amount of blood we started with. When the heart contracts, we squeeze a lot of that blood out, but a little bit of it remains. And the amount of blood that was ejected with one stroke of the heart is equal to the difference between these two. And we call that the stroke volume. We can affect the stroke volume with sympathetic stimulation. Turns out this will constrict the vena cavas a little bit. Usually we don't constrict veins very much, but when we constrict these two, it increases the speed of blood flowing through them because that blood has nowhere else to go. And therefore this tends to increase end diastolic volume. We fill up faster but we also squeeze harder with sympathetic stimulation. And by squeezing harder, we eject more blood out of the heart with every heartbeat, and therefore decreases ESV. There is less blood left over in the heart. Because that blood has now been ejected, that increases stroke volume. So for both of these reasons, sympathetic stimulation can increase stroke volume. I start with more and I have less left over. 
Sympathetic stimulation therefore increases the amount of blood ejected by the heart with every stroke. But not only does sympathetic stimulation increase stroke volume, it also affects the SA node and increases heart rate. So if I am beating faster and ejecting more blood every time, I'm going to greatly increase cardiac output. So that covers the two equations we already know. Sympathetic stimulation increases EDV while decreasing ESV. That increases stroke volume. We also increase heart rate, which leads to an increase in cardiac output. We're now ready to add that number into this equation and consider the effects of peripheral resistance on this final value, the one that we actually care about, what happens to blood pressure. Blood pressure is controlled short-term by the brain by altering the diameter of blood vessels. Long-term blood pressure control comes from the kidneys. We're going to be focusing on the brain and how it controls blood vessel diameter. There are sympathetic neurons here that can trigger vasoconstriction. Or these neurons can stop firing action potentials and to decide whether they should be firing or not, the medulla oblongata receives information from the body from baroreceptors which can measure blood pressure. We must now consider the medulla oblongata in greater detail. One part of the medulla oblongata is called the vasomotor center. Vaso, which stands for blood vessels, kind of looks like veins, and motor, which controls muscles. Just like the motor neurons that we talked about earlier in the term, these are controlling smooth muscles around the arterioles. And this part of the medulla oblongata is strictly sympathetic. So only sympathetic tone affects blood vessel diameter. When tone is high, the blood vessels are constricted and blood pressure should go up. When the tone is low, the blood vessels should dilate. This will decrease peripheral resistance which should in turn lower blood pressure. Conversely, the cardiac centers control heart rate, and these are both sympathetic and parasympathetic centers. And heart rate, as well as contractile force, predominantly affects cardiac output. The sympathetic tone increasing heart rate and decreasing ESV, whereas parasympathetic tone does the opposite lowering heart rate and tends to increase ESV. In response to increased blood pressure detected by those baroreceptors, this will activate the cardioinhibitory center, meaning heart rate should decrease, therefore cardiac output should decrease, and this should lead to a compensatory drop in blood pressure. On the other hand, if blood pressure drops too much, this will activate both the cardioacceleratory center, which speeds up heart rate, as well as activate the vasomotor center, which will cause an increase in peripheral resistance. And for both of these reasons, blood pressure should go back up. Let's illustrate this with some cartoons. An increase in blood pressure would be detected by those baroreceptors in the aorta and carotid bodies. This information would be sent to the medulla oblongata, and this increase in blood pressure would turn off sympathetic neurons while turning on the parasympathetic neurons of the cardioinhibitory center. The cardioinhibitory center would decrease heart rate, which should lower cardiac output, whereas the dismissal of vasomotor tone would cause blood vessels to relax. And for both of these reasons, blood pressure should drop back down to the homeostatic set point. Conversely, a drop in blood pressure is also detected by baroreceptors. This will activate the cardioacceleratory and the vasomotor centers while inhibiting the parasympathetic neurons of the cardioinhibitory centers, 
This should speed up heart rate and decrease ESV, which should increase cardiac output. And the increased vasomotor tone will constrict arterioles, leading to an increase in peripheral resistance, bringing our blood pressure back up to the homeostatic set point. The brain receives more inputs than simply blood pressure measurements. There are also chemoreceptors, which can detect levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood. Really what we care about is that all of our tissues are getting plenty of oxygen, and typically if blood pressure is low, then oxygen levels would also be low. But if oxygen levels are low for other reasons, then we will activate the sympathetic neurons of the cardioacceleratory and vasomotor centers. Let's review. The cardiac centers affect heart rate. I had both sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons, whereas the vasomotor centers controlled peripheral resistance. All of these are located in the medulla oblongata, and they receive information from baroreceptors and chemoreceptors located in places like the aorta and carotid bodies. The vasomotor centers and the cardioacceleratory centers were sympathetic neurons, whereas the cardioinhibitory center was parasympathetic neurons. So of our three equations now, the only one that the brain measures is blood pressure. Those baroreceptors signal to the medulla oblongata, and this can elicit a response. The vasomotor center can increase peripheral resistance. The cardioinhibitory center can decrease heart rate, while the cardioacceleratory centers can increase heart rate and decrease ESV. So if this is the only value out of all of these equations that the body can measure, these are the values that the body can actually adjust to try to compensate. We could possibly include EDV in here as well because we said the cardioacceleratory center tended to increase EDV. So let's put this into practice. If I give you these three equations on the test but then ask you one of these questions, you should be able to answer it fairly easily. A heart attack can damage muscle tissue in the heart. And if the heart is damaged, it can't squeeze as hard. So that will decrease contractility. What do you think that's going to affect directly? Well, if the heart isn't squeezing as hard, then there will probably be more blood left over in the heart at the end of every heartbeat. So that should increase ESV. An increase in this value will lead to a decrease in stroke volume, and a decrease in stroke volume would lead to a decrease in cardiac output, and a decrease in cardiac output would lead to a drop in blood pressure. Of course, that drop in blood pressure would be measured by the baroreceptors, which could activate the cardioacceleratory center, increasing heart rate, and the vasomotor center, increasing peripheral resistance. This increased heart rate should help mitigate some of the drop in cardiac output, and then an increased in peripheral resistance should do the rest, bringing our blood pressure back to its homeostatic set point. So that fixes the blood pressure problem, but we really don't like this chronically elevated heart rate. That's just going to cause the heart to wear out sooner and cause our patient to die at a younger age. Therefore, if somebody has a heart attack and survives, we like to bring them into the hospital to receive treatment because we know what the body is going to do to try and compensate for damage to the heart. It'll lead to an elevated resting heart rate, and that's just not healthy. On the other hand, what about aerobic exercise? That can cause the heart to grow stronger. Let me see if I can switch colors here. There we go. If the heart is stronger, what's going to happen? Well, the heart will contract with greater force. And if it contracts with greater force, then we should actually see a drop in ESV. And if we see a drop in ESV, that means stroke volume, 
is actually going to be higher. And if stroke volume is higher, then cardiac output would be higher. And if cardiac output was higher, then our blood pressure would be higher. But once again, we're going to trigger a homeostatic response to this. That increase in blood pressure would be detected by baroreceptors, which could activate the cardio-inhibitory centers. And that would lead to a drop in heart rate, which would then drop our cardiac output and our blood pressure back down to where we want. And this is exactly what we see. People who are in good aerobic health tend to have lower resting heart rates. Because their heart is stronger, it doesn't have to beat as often to maintain blood pressure. And this is one reason, one of many reasons, why aerobic exercise is very heart healthy. Next, we're going to consider vasodilation and vasoconstriction for a different reason. So for right now, we've been pretending like all of the arteries are constricting or all of the arteries are dilating all at once. And the body can do that to maintain blood pressure. But it's also possible to constrict or dilate just some arteries. And what that leads to is a redirection of blood flow, sending blood to some organs rather than others. So if body-wide vasodilation leads to a decrease in peripheral resistance and a decrease in blood pressure, if all of the arteries in the body were to constrict at the same time, that would increase peripheral resistance and blood pressure. But we next need to consider what happens when we constrict just some of the arteries and dilate others. Instead of changing blood pressure, this will change blood flow. For instance, if the mesenteric arteries are dilated, but the iliac arteries are a bit constricted, more blood would be flowing to our digestive tract, and less blood would be flowing to the muscles of our legs. But if we started exercising, sympathetic stimulation tends to cause the opposite to happen. We constrict the arteries leading to our guts, and dilate the ones leading to our musculature. Blood has been redirected. It's no longer flowing to the digestive tract. More blood is flowing to the leg muscles so that we can run. The brain can mediate some of these changes, like I just described, but it turns out that many of these changes in blood flow are controlled more locally. Another term for this would be autoregulation. And what this means is that specific organs can regulate the amount of blood flowing to them. Endothelial cells in any specific organ, if they detect low oxygen or high carbon dioxide levels, that can trigger vasodilation, as well as changes in pH, the release of the short-acting hormone nitric oxide, even some electrolytes, and some other molecules, like inflammatory molecules. These things all tend to lead to vasodilation, whereas these inflammatory molecules over here tend to lead to vasoconstriction, but just in a localized area. The one that we should focus on the most right now is nitric oxide. This small chemical is released by endothelial cells when they detect a drop in oxygen levels, and this diffuses just a short distance away. So small arterioles leading to this area should vasodilate, but arterioles far away should not get this signal at all. Therefore, when I'm running and my legs are using up all of their oxygen, the endothelial cells in the capillaries there release nitric oxide, which leads to more vasodilation, which should increase blood flow to the legs but this doesn't increase blood flow to my arms or other parts of my body because nitric oxide does not diffuse very far. Over here you may recognize this medication here, nitroglycerin. Turns out nitroglycerin absorbs into the bloodstream very quickly and is readily broken down into nitric oxide which can trigger vasodilation. And this is exactly what you would want to have happen around the heart if somebody was having a heart attack. So people at a high risk for a heart attack, such as they've had one in the past, 
and they will probably have another one in the future, may be given a nitroglycerin prescription to try and stop a heart attack when it happens next. Next, let's talk about how different organs regulate their own blood flow. For skeletal muscles, regulation is twofold. We have the autoregulatory mechanism that I discussed of those endothelial cells releasing nitric oxide when they detect a drop in oxygen. But sympathetic stimulation also tends to vasodilate arterioles leading to the muscles while constricting arterioles leading to the digestive tract. Now this is on top of body-wide vasoconstriction that we discussed earlier. So this is fairly complicated. We have two things happening at the same time. Nevertheless, this tends to increase blood flow to our skeletal muscles significantly with exercise. We can see up to 10 times more blood flowing to our muscles when we're exercising than when we're relaxed. Blood flow to the skin is also tightly regulated, but in this case it's due to changes in temperature detected by the hypothalamus. When we are cold, blood flow to the capillary beds close to the skin is restricted and instead it flows back towards our internal organs and this helps to maintain heat. On the other hand, when the hypothalamus detects elevated body temperature, these arterioles leading to the capillary beds in the dermis open up, bringing blood closer to the surface of our body and the heat from this blood can be lost due to sweating and radiation. This tends to decrease body temperature. Next up, the autoregulatory mechanisms of the lungs are kind of funky. In this case, we actually do the opposite. When there is a drop in oxygen levels, this actually leads to vasoconstriction. But this forces more of the fluid out of the blood vessels and closer to the air pockets of the lungs where it picks up oxygen. So this vasoconstriction tends to increase the amount of oxygen in the arterioles and capillaries here. The heart is very similar to skeletal muscle. With exercise, sympathetic stimulation causes vasodilation of all of those coronary arteries, and this can increase blood flow to the heart three or fourfold. The brain, on the other hand, never needs more blood, but it also can't deal with less blood. So blood pressure to the brain should remain constant, either when we're relaxed or when we are exercising. So let's put this all together, both the systemic control and these autoregulatory mechanisms. Let's say I started out with roughly the same amount of blood going to my brain, muscles, skin, and my internal organs. If I started exercising, my muscles would need more oxygen because they've been using it up. So the drop in oxygen there would lead to the release of nitric oxide from the endothelial cells, which would lead to vasodilation just in the area of the muscles that were exercising the most heavily. So this would increase blood flow to the muscles. But as we continue to exercise, our body temperature would go up as well. And so the hypothalamus would trigger vasodilation near the skin and more blood flow would get close to the surface of the body helping to reduce my body temperature. But every time I'm increasing blood flow to my muscles and my skin, that means I'm getting less blood flow to these other places like my viscera and brain. So if my liver and other internal organs weren't getting enough oxygen now, then they would release nitric oxide and that would lead to vasodilation so that they could get enough oxygen to survive. But of course, we can't give more oxygen to everybody, not by simply redirecting blood flow. So if everybody is triggering vasodilation, trying to get more oxygen, the brain is going to see a drop in oxygen levels, and the brain is not going to be happy about that. But rather than try and fix this with localized control, the brain's going to be a little trickier. It can activate the vasomotor and cardioacceleratory centers, telling the heart to work harder so that everybody can get more oxygen. 
So here we see both auto-regulatory mechanisms in play and the systemic control. Lastly, we need to discuss a very important topic, and that is the topic of angiogenesis. If a tissue becomes hypoxic, it can release nitric oxide to try and fix the problem. But if vasodilation isn't fixing the problem, then we might need to go to a more long-term solution. And many organs, or tissues, if they suffer from chronic hypoxia, will tend to release growth factors that trigger angiogenesis. One such growth factor is a molecule called VEGF, and this will diffuse just a short distance away and activate endothelial cells to do something different, which is to undergo mitosis. And they will grow towards the source of this angiogenic signal, bringing more blood to this area. So if this hypoxic tissue was your leg muscles, and you were making it hypoxic by going jogging regularly, over time you would expect to see increased blood vessel growth around the muscles in your legs. We discussed this in BI-231 when we talked about the muscular system. However, this hypoxic tissue could also be a tumor. Many cancers grow to a certain size and then stop growing. They're too big to keep growing because they're not getting enough nutrients to maintain a high growth rate. And we would say that tumor is benign. If it's not growing any faster, we might not worry about it. The tumors that we do worry about are the ones that learn to turn on angiogenic signals and increase the growth of blood vessels into the tumor. This not only allows the tumor to grow faster, it also provides a way for tumor cells to escape and metastasize to other parts of the body. Therefore, sometimes when we're treating cancer, we might give a patient a drug that blocks angiogenesis. And that might be useful if they are undergoing chemotherapy and we're trying to kill off a tumor. You wouldn't want to do this any other time. For everybody else, angiogenesis is healthy. We actually want more blood vessels. Recall that more blood vessels meant that even if you block one with a little bit of atherosclerosis, we now have redundant pathways. Around the heart, this is especially healthy, and you would definitely not want to be blocking angiogenesis any other time other than during cancer treatment. This angiogenesis is a long-term change. It takes weeks to months for these new blood vessels to grow. But here are a couple pictures of blood vessel growth. We see in a site of blockage, new little capillaries are growing around the blocked artery. And eventually this will reconnect the two ends and blood flow should resume. Over here on the right, we see just how extensive these capillary beds can be around the heart. We've stained the left and right coronary arteries with different colors, forcing plastic all the way up into the capillary beds. And we can increase the number of capillaries in this area with increased aerobic activity. So that wraps us up for today. And we added this last equation. And this equation was probably the most important because what we really care about is our patient's blood pressure. However, we had to learn the other two because blood pressure was determined by factors in the other two equations. We talked about ways that blood pressure could be regulated quickly. The brain could control heart rate and peripheral resistance. And then we talked about a few more long-term regulatory mechanisms, especially angiogenesis. And then we added that more than just the brain regulates blood flow. We talked about those auto-regulatory mechanisms especially the local acting vasodilator, nitric oxide. That was one of our most important ones.